Now, in the past 30 years, 40 years, f among scholars, few periods, probably no period of American history has been the subject of such a complete reevaluation, complete overturning of a standard traditional point of view as Reconstruction. Um, beginning with what was called at the time the second Reconstruction, that is the Civil Rights Revolution of the 19, I think it was C. Van Woodward, the historian who coined that phrase, the second Reconstruction. Um, his, uh, a flood of works appeared on the aftermath of the Civil War, re-examining every single aspect, political, economic, social, uh, et cetera. And the result was the overthrow of an interpretation that had exerted a, remarkable, a remarkably long-lived hold on our historical imagination and our political imagination, as I will show. This is what we call the Dunning School, named for William A. Dunning, a very prominent professor of history here at Columbia. The Dunning School is directly associated with Columbia University. It's part of our legacy, unfortunately, to American society. Um, and it originated in the work of William Dunning, John W. Burgess here at Columbia, and a whole bunch of their students who did doctoral theses, published his books on Reconstruction in different states. Now, the, this view was that Reconstruction was an era of complete sordidness in American political and social life, the lowest point in the whole saga of American democracy. Um, According to this view, very quickly, Lincoln, when he was killed, had planned a quick and uh, painless readmission of the southern states into the Union as equal members of the national family. Lincoln's successor, Andrew Johnson, attempted to carry out Lincoln's policies, but was thwarted, foiled by the radical Republicans, led by Thaddeus Stevens there. They were, they were called in various works, the Jacobins, the Vindictives, or the Radicals, motivated by an irrational hatred of rebels or the desire to fasten Republican rule on the defeated South or, depending on the book, the desire to bring the South under the control of Northern capitalism or some combination of all of those. Um, they, uh, the Radicals swept aside Johnson's lenient policy and imposed black supremacy, as it was called, upon the defeated Confederacy. They followed by giving black men the right to vote, for which they were completely ill-equipped. Uh, there followed an orgy of corruption uh, presided over by these unscrupulous carpetbaggers, that is, northerners who ventured south to reap the spoils of office, Scalawags, another Reconstruction term uh, which meant white Southerners who betrayed their race and cooperated with these new governments, and the freed people whose role was rather ambiguous. On the one hand, they spoke of black supremacy, but actually the basic account was that blacks were just childlike, ignorant, and manipulated by others. They weren't actually historical actors. They were manipulated by these unscrupulated, uh, unscrupulous whites. They were incapable, but the main point was blacks were incapable of exercising intelligently the political power that the North had thrust upon them. After much needless suffering, according to this view, the white community of the South banded together and overthrew these governments and restored what was called home rule through patriotic organizations like the Ku Klux Klan. So all told, this was the darkest page in American history. Now this interpretation, which actually originated in Reconstruction, in the anti-Reconstruction propaganda of, um, of Democrats, of, of Southern Democrats, and in fact, one of, uh, th these historians were not only total racists, but lousy historians, because they took at face value the charges, the accusations of Democratic Party propaganda without ever actually trying to check whether their charges were true or not. They just would take things out of these party pamphlets and say, oh, look, look how terrible it is. Nobody in this 
South Carolina legislature knew how to read and write. Well, that wasn't true. You could easily go to the census and discover they could read and write. But you didn't have to do that if you just believed everything the white supremacist Southerners said. So, okay. Um, but this interpretation dominated historical thinking for well over half a century, which is highly unusual. We pride ourselves, perhaps wrongly, in the rapid turnover of historical interpretations. Our papers this term are little exercises in looking at that in many cases, how is historic, but it's impossible to think of a basic outlook on a period of American history that remained fundamentally the same from 1900 to 1960 or so. It would be as if in 1970 people were still simply adopting Charles Beer's view of the Constitution, which he put forward in 1913. It just doesn't happen that way. Um, but this view of Reconstruction, not, it was not only a scholarly matter, it reached a much broader audience through films like Birth of a Nation, which we will come to in a minute, which had its premiere at the White House under Woodrow Wilson in 1915. Very few films premiere at the White House. Um, Gone with the Wind, the most popular film ever made in America, and bestsellers like Claude G. Bowers' The Tragic Era, published in 1929. Bowers, um, in colorful, exaggerated language, but this great bestseller about Reconstruction told how Andrew Johnson, quote, fought the bravest battle for constitutional liberty ever waged by an executive, but was overwhelmed by the radicals. Southern whites, quote, literally were put to the torture during Reconstruction. Um, by emissaries of hate who manipulated the, quote, simple-minded freedmen, and in fact inspired lustful assaults by blacks upon white womanhood. In fact, in this view, as another history put it, rape is the product of reconstruction in the South. As if there was no rape in the South before reconstruction, the thousands and thousands of black women who were sexually assaulted by Owners were not, that didn't count as rape. Only what happened to white women was, if it did, was, uh, was rape in the South. 